Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. John P. Holdren. John is the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy, Harvard Kennedy School, and Professor of Environmental Science and Policy in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. Uh, he has a lot of other titles, but I will uh, skip those. Uh, and he recently returned to Harvard uh, earlier this year. Uh, he, John Holdren, was President Obama's science advisor for both terms. Uh, and he was also the Senate confirmed director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He has been a longtime leader um, prior to being the science advisor uh, in science and policy of climate change. He's also played during the Obama administration a lead role in the international climate uh, agreements, particularly working with China and also obviously uh, with the Paris Agreement. He's going to address um, what's happened since he left uh, the White House, the impact of the Trump administration and its retreat on U.S. national and international climate change commitments, and what the world can still do about it uh, on the private and public front. His talk today, uh, interesting title, the, wa the Wafflers are wrong. Try to say that very fast. The Wafflers are wrong. Addressing climate change is urgent and a bargain. We're really, really grateful that John was willing to, as many of our speakers, to fly from Boston to San Francisco uh, to give this talk and head back uh, tomorrow morning. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. John Holdren to the stage to give his plenary talk. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to all of you for being here. It really is a great privilege to address this extraordinary group. I'm hoping that there will be 1,364 articles written about uh, the observations that I'm about to make. I'm going to uh, address a topic that is uh, a great challenge in science. It's a great challenge for science journalists. It's a great challenge for society. Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, join uh, Chris in her earlier tribute to David Perlman. Uh, I've known and worked with David Perlman for literally 50 years. That's a larger part of my lifespan than it is of his but it was always uh, an enormous pleasure to work with David, a real pillar of the science journalism community, and I too regret that he couldn't be with us here today. So let me start by outlining where I'm going to go. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about fundamentals of climate change just as a foundation for uh, where I'm then going. I'm going to uh, categorize what I call contrarian confusions in three categories, denial, waffling, and surrender. It's sometimes said that there are three stages of disagreement on issues like climate change. The first stage is they tell you you're wrong and they can prove it. The second stage is they tell you you're right but it doesn't matter. And the third stage is they tell you it matters but it's too late to do anything about it. Those are the three stages I label denial, waffling, and surrender, and I'll come back to that. I'm going to talk about rebutting denial, how we know climate change is real, about rebutting waffling, how we know climate change is urgent, and about rejecting surrender, how we know that fixing climate change will be a bargain. So let me start with the fundamentals and quote the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan, U.S. Senator, Ambassador to India. Uh, Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Here are some of the facts. The carbon dioxide emissions, let me see, did I miss one here? Something has gone amiss. The, the slide that I'm missing is one that showed that in the 
uh, 150 some years, 165 actually, from 1850 to 2015, the growth of the world's population and the growth of prosperity caused energy use to increase 22-fold. And most of that growth was due to the expansion in the first 100 years of that period, 1850 to 1950, to the growth of coal, in the last part of the period to the growth of oil and natural gas, and the result was uh, a world that in 2015 remained 80% dependent on fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas for its energy supply, and two-thirds dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas for its electricity supply. An extraordinarily fossil fuel dependent world, and what happened over this period, as shown on this slide, is that the carbon dioxide emissions of civilization tracked the rise of fossil fuel use, augmented by emissions from deforestation. It notes there that coal is roughly just carbon and hydrogen, oil is CH2, natural gas CH4, wood CH2O, and in each of those cases when you burn them, what you get is carbon dioxide and water, and with today's technology, all of the carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. The uh, water vapor, the H2O, stays in the atmosphere only briefly. Those additions don't accumulate there, but some of the CO2 stays for a very long time and accumulates, and that's where the great bulk of our problem comes from. The atmospheric content of carbon dioxide grew markedly uh, over the period, uh, particularly since the agricultural revolution, and more precipitously even uh, since the Industrial Revolution, and you see that in this uh, diagram, the larger panel, uh, some 10,000 years of uh, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. On the right, the forcing, as climate scientists call it, literally how hard that carbon dioxide concentration is pushing on the climate of the Earth. Forcing is a good term, even though a technical term. The, Carbon dioxide concentration in 2016 was 45% higher than in 1750, the nominal start of the Industrial Revolution. You see in this picture the long gradual rise of carbon dioxide during the Agricultural Revolution, largely from deforestation and land use change, and then this incredibly precipitous rise in the Industrial Revolution. Humans have added some other heat trapping gases. Uh, besides CO2 shown here, the CO2 on top, but then methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, uh, and others, mostly chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons. And what we see, and this again is fact, this is observation, not modeling, these are the global average surface air temperatures from 1880, about the point where worldwide thermometer measurements were dense enough and frequent enough to meaningfully calculate a global average surface temperature. You see that 2016 was the hottest year on record, 2015 the second hottest, 2014 the third hottest, 2017 through last month on track to surpass 2015 for second place. And indeed the Earth has been warming more or less continuously for a hundred and more years as the increasing forcing from the greenhouse gas buildup caused by human beings came to dominate the natural variability in climate. That natural variability is what gives this curve its bumpiness. But global warming is in fact, while a very widely used term, something of a misnomer. The term global warming implies something that's uniform across the planet, that's mainly about temperature, that's gradual, and that's quite possibly benign. What, after all, could be the matter with uh, winters that are a little warmer, the ability to swim a little later in the fall or a little earlier in the spring? But in fact, that term seems to have confused people. What's actually happening is highly non-uniform. It's not just about temperature. It's rapid compared to the capacity of both ecosystems and human societies for adjustment, and it's harmful for most places and times. Some places for some years may get some benefits, but as we will see, on the whole, the further climate change proceeds, the more 
uniformly it is a strongly negative influence on human well-being and on the environment. A more descriptive term would be global climate disruption. This shows simply how non-uniform the temperature change is. This is the uh, annual average surface temperature increase for uh, 2016, the last complete year. Uh, the average compared to a baseline that was taken in this case to be the baseline from 51 to 1980 was about 1 degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and what you see is that astonishingly across the Arctic and some of the mid-continents in the northern hemisphere, the temperature increase was two to four times as much compared to the baseline as the global average. Uneven temperature changes, of course, mean changes in the circulation of the atmosphere and the circulation of the ocean, which in turn entrain other changes important to our weather. But the changes are not just about temperature. Climate means the patterns of weather, the averages, the extremes, the timing, and the spatial distribution, yes, of hot and cold, but also of cloudy and clear, humid and dry, drizzles, downpours, and hail, snowfall, snowpack, and snowmelt, breezes, blizzards, tornadoes, typhoons. Climate change entails disruption of the patterns. The global average surface temperature is just an index of the state of the global climate system as expressed in those patterns. And small changes in the index correspond to big changes in the system very much as your body temperature is just an index of the state of a very complex underlying system. When that index changes a little bit, 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, you know it's telling you something is seriously amiss in that underlying system. And it's particularly important that when the average of any of these weather variables changes, the extremes change much more. That principle holds for any normally distributed climate variable, as illustrated schematically here. That is, a modest change in the average produces big changes at the tails. And we will see some specific examples of how that is happening in the world. Absolutely key message. The extremes change much more rapidly than the averages. These changes matter because climate governs and therefore altering climate affects the availability of water, the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries, the prevalence of oppressive heat and humidity, the formation and dispersion of air pollutants, the geography of disease, the damages that we have to expect from storms, floods, droughts, and wildfires, the property losses from sea level rise, the amount of money we have to spend on engineered environments, the dams, the dikes, the air conditioning, and the distribution and abundance of species, those we need, those we love, and those we hate. So let me categorize the contrarian confusions and start with a famous line from Mark Twain, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots on. Classes of contrarian arguments, type one, the Earth isn't really warming. Type 2, it's warming, but humans have nothing to do with it. Type 3, humans may have something to do with it, but one, we don't know how much. Or second, it doesn't matter because it's a good thing. Or third, it's slow, so we have plenty of time to adapt. Or fourth, we're better off investing in economic development than addressing climate change directly. And type four, yes, the human role is large and dangerous, and development alone is inadequate protection, but it's too late or too costly to fix it. So let's just hunker down. Oops, let me go back. So this just indicates how I've labeled those three sets of contrarian arguments, type one and two, denial, type three, various forms of waffling, and type four, surrender. Among contemporary contrarians, I think the wafflers are the ones being taken most seriously and therefore doing the most to muddy the water. 
the numbers of deniers are dwindling in the face of ever more obvious climate change that everyone can see and for which no one has offered a plausible alternative explanation to human influence. The wafflers are more numerous and they seem less unreasonable. They're not denying the obvious and their arguments are more nuanced than those of the deniers. Those suggesting surrender while slowly increasing in number are, argue, are offering an argument of despair that is unpalatable to most of those who agree that the problem is real. I'll be offering rebuttals to the arguments of all three categories of contrarians, but I'll spend the most time on the most dangerous arguments, the arguments of the wafflers. But I'll start with rebutting the deniers, and I like this line from Neil deGrasse Tyson, science is true whether or not you believe in it. There is absolutely no scientific doubt that the world is warming. Trends in every relevant indicator are consistent in giving us that message. And again, I think the print is probably too small here to be seen all across the room. But the indicators top to bottom on the left, air temperature near land surface, sea surface water temperature, air temperature over the ocean, global average sea level, northern hemispheric spring snow cover, the one going down at the bottom on the left, and then going up on the right, the temperature higher in the troposphere above the surface of the earth, the amount of heat stored in the ocean to a depth of 700 meters, specific humidity, the September Arctic sea ice area, and the mass of glaciers on the bottom right. Every one of them, every one of those indicators is telling us the same story. The world is warming. There was no hiatus. Hiatus means pause. The claim that there was a pause in warming for 10 to 15 years after 1998 rests on the fact that the exceptionally high 1998 temperature, which was boosted by a strong El Nino, was not exceeded until 2005 and was about the same as the 2009 and 2013 values. But that claim cherry picks specific dates to compare in contrast to the scientific procedure of finding the best fit, the best straight line fit through all of the years in the period of interest. By that standard, warming was slower between 1998 and 2013 than in the preceding 15 years, but it didn't pause. The red line for that period is the best fit, and of course, the very rapid warming resumed thereafter. Humans are clearly the cause. Nature was heading the other way. Natural influences, mainly the variations in Earth's orbit and axis of rotation, we're putting the Earth in a long-term cooling phase for 6,500 years before the Industrial Revolution. We were cooling and we would, would have continued to cool for perhaps another 10,000 years into another ice age had humans not intervened. So we fixed that problem. We saved ourselves from another ice age, but we overcompensated. So let me turn to rebutting the wafflers. And here, the quote, you may be able to fool the voters, but not the atmosphere. The late Dana Meadows, one of the co-authors of Limits to Growth in 1971. We actually know how much of the warming trend is human caused. Over the last 60 years, when the human influences became really dominant over the natural influences, essentially all of the warming has been caused by human influences. What you see here is what was actually observed in the temperature change of the Earth over this period, the black line on the top, the human well-mixed greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, human emissions of particulate matters and short-lived greenhouse gases and negative influence on net, and then the basically neutral influences over this period of solar variability, volcanoes, and internal variability, the two arrows point to the observations and the net human influence. And as you can see very closely, the net human influence, uh, as expected from what we've added to the atmosphere, accounts for the observed increase in temperature. The wafflers claim that there's a lot of uncertainty about the human role is simply wrong. It's just flat wrong. 
Second point rebutting the wafflers, climate change is already causing serious harm. This is not just a problem for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that we can safely postpone for a while and watch and see what happens. Around the world, we're seeing variously increases in floods, drought, wildfires, heat waves, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, coastal erosion and inundation, the power of the strongest storms, permafrost thawing and subsidence, expanding impacts of pests and pathogens, altered distribution and abundance of valued species, and all of these are plausibly linked to climate change by theory, by models, and by observed fingerprints, that, in, that is the patterns in which these phenomena are occurring, and most are growing faster than was projected just 10 or 15 years ago. One of the most obvious examples is increases in torrential downpours and torrential downpours leading to floods. The physics here is rather elementary. A warmer atmosphere holds more water, and so more can and does come down at one time. This is for the United States. The uh, extreme one-day precipitation events in the contiguous 48 states from 1910 to 2015, percent of land area affected by those extreme events. Again, there's some natural variability. The curve bounces up and down, but the trend is clear. Those downpours do lead to floods. Hundred-year floods, so-called, are now occurring once a decade in many places. Three 500-year floods occurred in Houston in three years. Makes you realize we do have to change our understanding of what a 500-year flood is. Uh, that's not just happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world. Uh, here's a picture from Central Europe in the spring of 2013. Extraordinary flooding. This is from Munich Re, the reinsurance company. And yet, in a wetter world overall, many drought-prone regions are getting more drought-prone. How is this happening? Well, it's happening through a number of phenomena that, again, are relatively well understood. Higher temperatures mean bigger losses to evaporation, drying out the soil. More of the rain falling in extreme events means that more loss, uh, more of the water that falls is lost to flood runoff instead of soaking into the soil. The mountains are getting more rain rather than snow, and that yields more runoff in the winter and leave, leaving less for runoff in the summer. Early spring snow melt resulting from uh, warmer temperatures also leaves less runoff for the summer. And the altered atmospheric circulation patterns, which I mentioned before, altered because the temperature increases are uneven, are also playing a role in some places experiencing increasing drought. The Amazon is a particularly vulnerable region that has been experiencing uh, episodes of extreme drought. This is the precipitation index for Brazil for the two years, 19, uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, and you see the very dry and extremely dry conditions uh, prevailing over a very large part of the Amazon. Uh, here's one showing uh, China simultaneously suffering from floods and droughts, a more than 30-year weakening of the East Asia monsoon, again, uh, a circulation pattern effect attributed to global climate change by the Chinese own climate models has meant less moisture flow over China from the south to the north. That's produced increased flooding in the south, increased drought in the north, has already had serious impacts on Chinese agriculture. And those are Chinese findings, by the way, illustrated there. Uh, wildfires. Wildfires uh, for a long time was one of the sleepers in the panoply of impacts of climate change in the sense that People studying this question knew that wildfires were increasing and would continue to increase uh, under climate change, but hardly anyone had noticed. Recently, people have been noticing. This is a graph of the number of millions of acres burned annually by wildfires in the United States from 1981 to 2015. Again, a lot of annual variability, but the trend is completely clear. Heat is contributing, drought is contributing, more dead trees killed by pests contributing, and more lightning in a warming world. There's more lightning in a warming world. This was one of my own postdoctoral fellows who did the definitive work establishing this. 
You look at the Western United States, this is slightly out of date. This slide uh, was made in July of this year, uh, by which time 3.4 million acres had already burned in the United States. The fire season in the United States is now three months longer than it was 40 years ago. The average fire is much bigger and hotter than before. Uh, smaller fires burn at 1,300 or 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Big ones at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit or more. That means they spread faster, they destroy more property, they pose far bigger risks to firefighters. And of course, we've seen in the very recent fires in Northern California, in the Napa Valley and Santa Rosa, uh, another example of this. In Alaska, even the tundra is now burning. Tundra never used to burn in the far north. Now the tundra is burning in the far north. There has been a huge increase in heat waves. This is the real illustration of the theoretical phenomenon I showed you at the beginning of the talk, where when you slide a normal distribution in terms of its average a little bit toward the warm side, uh, the extremes change drastically. These uh, curves are observations. They are not modeling. Uh, they are not projections. They are what has happened between the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The uh, orange and yellow and green curves uh, that very closely resemble a normal distribution, which is shown there in black. And then what happened in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s as global warming overall slid those distributions to the right. And what you need to look at is what happened to the frequency of occurrence of events at three sigma, three standard deviations uh, away from a typical hot summer. Uh, this is uh, showing us that the portion of northern hemisphere land experiencing uh, a summer that is so hot that it was a one, in a one in 700 year summer before we started to change the climate. Uh, the area of land experiencing a one in 700 year summer has gone up by 50 to 100 fold in the few decades since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And heat already makes working outdoors dangerous in summer in many regions. You take a serious risk of heat stroke and death if you work outdoors when something called the wet bulb global temperature exceeds 34 degrees C. And what is uh, evident in this, uh, in this particular illustration is that those kinds of temperatures are already being experienced in many parts of the world. And looking forward, the uh, prospect is for a great expansion in the parts of the world where it simply becomes impossible to work outside in the hottest months of the year. Construction, agriculture, fisheries, uh, heavy outdoor work will be impossible. Coral bleaching uh, this year has seen the strongest coral bleaching events, the most widespread coral bleaching events in recorded history. Uh, there's a new film out, by the way, called Chasing Coral, which is a sequel to the film Chasing Ice. The film Chasing Ice was about how rapidly the Greenland ice sheet is falling into the sea. The film Chasing Coral is about how rapidly corals all over the world are disappearing, are dying, because of the combination of warm water and acidification. Uh, the acidification comes because about a third of the carbon dioxide which we add to the atmosphere is quickly taken up by the surface layer of the ocean. It reacts H2O plus CO2 makes H2CO3. That is weak carbonic acid, lowers the pH of the ocean. The chemistry is rather simple. The death of the coral reefs in the Florida Keys, very dramatic, being devastated, those reefs, by multiple stresses, warming water and acidification, the most important ones. Less than 10% of that reef's, reef system is now covered by living coral. And this, uh, the red circles show percentage declines just since 1996. Thawing and subsiding permafrost. When permafrost in the far north uh, thaws, as it is now doing, buildings that are built on it, roads that are built over it, pipelines, uh, all suffer uh, damage, all these kinds of infrastructure at risk in the far north. Sea level rise has been accelerating. The average rate of sea level rise worldwide from 19, 
1992 to 2016 was twice the 20th century average. The trend from 2010 to 2016 was twice that average, or four times the 20th century average. It's accelerating. And that is producing more coastal inundation. This again is for the east coast of the United States, comparing the average number of flood events per year on cities in the coastline uh, from the 50s uh, to the end of the 60s, the 70s and 80s. And then you look at the 90s to 2009 and 2010 to 2015. 2010 to 2015, the blue lines at the bottom. This impact is growing dramatically. And again, these are observations, not predictions. Rising sea level is, of course, producing uh, coastal erosion. This happens to be from Cape Cod, where I live. Stronger tropical storms. Absolutely extraordinary that the strongest tropical storms, or in one or two cases, the second or third strongest, in virtually every basin where they occur, have occurred since 2012. Uh, here's the list. Uh, most recently, uh, October of this year, just a few days ago, Ophelia, uh, the strongest Category 3 hurricane uh, ever to get anywhere near Ireland. Uh, Eastern Atlantic, uh, quite remarkable. And it's not coincidence. We know the tropical cyclones get their energy from the warm surface layer of the ocean. That layer is getting both warmer and deeper under climate change, and that means more energy is available for evaporating water from the ocean surface. And when the water vapor condenses, that's what causes the hurricane. It heats the atmosphere, the heated air rises, that lowers the temperature at the surface, that causes the air from surrounding areas to flow in. It flows in in a spiral pattern because of Coriolis forces. That's how hurricanes come about. And while there are many factors that govern the formation of individual hurricanes, the fact is that more ocean energy yields stronger cyclones and deeper ocean warm layers mean that a self-limiting characteristic of hurricanes, which is that they churn up big waves, which then bring up colder water from the depths, that self-limiting phenomenon is weakened as the hot layer deepens and the churning of the waves no longer reaches the cold water to bring it up to the surface to weaken the tropical storm. So yes, many factors affect the formation and tracks of these storms, but Everything else being equal, a given cyclone is going to be more powerful in the presence of a warmer ocean with a deeper warm layer than it would otherwise be. And of course, the higher local sea level is, the worse the storm surge is for any given cyclone. The diagram here, print again, doubtless too small to be read in most of the room, simply shows that in the region in the Pacific that spawned cyclone Haiyan, one of the strongest Pacific cyclones ever measured, the heat potential associated with the temperature and the depth of that surface layer had gone up 20% since 1990. Pest outbreaks. Pine bark beetles get a longer breeding season courtesy of warming. They get four generations in a summer rather than three. And that has helped them devastate trees already weakened by heat and drought in California, in Colorado, in Alaska. All those red trees are dead. They've been killed by pine bark beetles, millions of hectares. Another form of growing harm, disease vectors and pathogens spreading from the tropics, the subtropics, into the mid-latitudes. West Nile virus, Lyme disease, Zika, uh, all of that happening. Impacts on valued species, these are just the titles uh, from a few recent scientific journals on effects of climate change, uh, observed effects of climate change on commercially valuable fish species. And here's one that is really troubling to many of us. Uh, this picture, the left-hand part of this picture, shows 35,000 walruses who have climbed up onto the shore uh, near Point Lay, Alaska in 2014 because the summer sea ice, essential to their feeding patterns at sea, has disappeared. And now they're all up on shore where the juveniles all get trampled by the adults moving around and where there is nothing for them to eat. 
the picture of the inset at the lower right shows the annual minimum Arctic sea ice extent in September of every year and how it has dropped precipitously uh, since satellite observations gave us good indications of this area, the area covered by sea ice uh, in the summer in the Arctic, extending to 2016 in this case. In the face of these impacts, observed and growing, the arguments of some wafflers that climate change is good for us seem rather perverse. It is true some places may benefit from longer growing seasons, from warmer winters, from increased carbon dioxide fertilization of plants for a few decades, but that cannot compensate for all the harms that I've just summarized. Longer growing seasons are counteracted by effects of extremes in extreme heat, drought, hailstorms, and pests. Many fewer people die of extreme cold in winter than die of extreme heat in summer, and that gap is growing under global climate change. That is, we're, we're adding more people to the death toll in summer than we're reducing from the death toll in winter. And carbon dioxide fertilization only works for some plants and only when water and other nutrients are in adequate supply. And it is counteracted by heat, drought, storms, and pests. So the wafflers are really wrong to suggest that there is some balance between the good and the bad in global climate change. Wafflers also underestimate what's coming. Global average temperature continues to increase under all plausible scenarios. There is nothing that we can plausibly do to stop temperature increase in its tracks. And the momentum in the climate system means that the temperature continues to go up even after atmospheric conditions stabilize, and sea level continues to go up even after temperature stabilizes. The last time the global average surface temperature was two degrees Celsius above the 1900 level was 130,000 years ago, and we know from paleoclimatological evidence that at that time, sea level was four to six meters higher than it is today. The last time the temperature was three degrees C higher than the 1900 value was about 30 million years ago, a time when there were palm trees and alligators in Greenland, and the sea level was 20 to 30 meters higher than today. Increases in heat extremes are coming. We've already seen a lot of that. We're going to see a lot more. Here are, again, a number of recent scientific publications on what we expect to happen with respect to heat waves. And elaborating on this just a bit, the summer heat wave of 2003 in southwestern Europe, southern France, Spain, northern Italy, estimated to have killed between 35,000 and 70,000 people, estimated to have reduced agricultural production in the region by 30%. At the time that occurred, it was a one in 100 year event. Before humans started fiddling with the climate, it was a one in 250 year event. Under business as usual, BAU here stands for business as usual, by 2014 that will be an average summer, an average summer. And by the 2060s, the summer, as hot as the one that killed between 35,000 and 70,000 people in Europe, will be an unusually cold summer for that part of Europe. That's what's coming and that the wafflers underestimate. U.S. heat waves at mid-century under business as usual in the United States. What these colors show is the factor of increase in total heat wave days where the bottom of the scale is no increase and the top of the scale is a six-fold increase in the number of heat wave days per year. This is United States at mid-century and look at the parts of the United States where the number of heat wave days will go up by six-fold, all of that bright orange. Declining crop yields. You see here that the yields of some crops go up a little bit for some time under warming, but then as warming proceeds, they all go down. And these declines in yields of corn, of soybeans, of rice, and wheat take no account of the possibility, which we now know is a probability, of increase in droughts 
And you look at what's coming in drought, huge increases in drought are coming under business as usual. At the top, the frequency of droughts of four to six month duration, a uh, number of droughts of that sort per 30 years, uh, with a scale where very few of them are on the left, the purple and blue colors. Uh, when you're having lots of them, it's on the right, the yellow, uh, orange, and red colors. And what we see at the bottom is a medium high scenario from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and what you see is red and yellow uh, over huge parts of the world, big increases in the number of four to six month duration droughts. Wildfires, we've already seen the areas of wildfires going way, way up. They are projected to go up much more. The percentage increases shown here are increases in median annual area burned for a one degree Celsius increase in global average surface temperature referenced to the 1950 to 2003 average. And you see in the western United States, many parts of it, the average annual area burn going up from 100 percent to 400, even 500 percent. Astonishing increases in areas burned. And again, this is happening, expected to happen, projected to happen all over the world. Increased storminess, uh, again, scientific publications, including uh, that of my student, David Romps, my former student, uh, showing uh, what's happening to lightning strikes and what's going to continue to happening with lightning, lightning strikes. Uh, tropical cyclones and coastal flooding in New York City. Increased in severe thunderstorm environments in lots of places. Uh, and this is a dandy for those who live in the United States. I apologize that this presentation is so US centric. I had to put it together uh, in rather short order. But what you're seeing for the United States in many of these diagrams is being replicated all around the world. Uh, this shows uh, what is probably the best hurricane model we have, uh, projecting an increase in category three to five landfalling hurricanes in the north uh, northeastern United States uh, under a, just a medium emission scenario, not the highest emission scenario, just a medium one, with the projection that we'll have landfalling category three to five hurricanes in Maine, uh, which has never uh, happened uh, before. Uh, my favorite uh, political cartoonist is Tom Tolles of the Washington Post. Uh, I like this one, uh, summarizing uh, where we stand with respect to climate and extreme weather. I hope you can all read it. Uh, floods, heat waves, tornadoes, fires, freak snow, freak drought, and on the far right, predictable response, an audience, uh, an ostrich with its head in the sand. Uh, sea level. Sea level could rise by one to two meters more uh, by 2100. A uh, very wide range of possibilities uh, depending on whether we have a very low uh, emissions trajectory where the world takes aggressive action versus a very high one. Uh, sea level rise continues for many centuries after 2100 in all scenarios. This is the worst thing about sea level rise. It just keeps going even after the temperatures stabilize. Uh, and it will ultimately reach two meters or more per degree of global average warming. Two degrees means four and a half meters of sea level rise. So when anyone tells you that the officially embraced two degree C target uh, means we're safe, uh, don't believe it. We're already experiencing serious impact at one degree Celsius and we're in for much more even at two. Not as much as at three or four, uh, which makes it worth taking action. These are areas of the east coast of the United States that would be flooded with a one meter sea level rise. Again, this could be replicated for other parts of the world with low lying coastlines. Acidification, what's coming is continued big drops in the pH of the ocean, big impacts on marine life. Uh, adverse effects, of course, are already being observed, but what this tells us, this projection, is that coral reefs could be dead or in peril over most of the range by the middle of the current century. And by the way, coral reefs are the second largest reservoir of biodiversity on the planet. The biggest reservoir is the tropical forests, and they are also under special threat from climate change. The wafflers also minimize what could happen, things that are not projected. We don't know enough to put numbers on their probability. 
but they are plausible. Greatly accelerated sea level rise from rapid disintegration of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Rapid release of methane and carbon dioxide from thawing permafrost, warming Arctic sediments, which would accelerate all climate-related impacts all over the world. Massive drying and fires in the formerly moist tropics with huge damage to local peoples and biodiversity. A crash in ocean fisheries caused by a combination of warming, acidification, oxygen depletion, toxics, overfishing, all the stresses that are affecting our ocean. A collapse of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation shutting down the Gulf Stream with drastic effects on the winter climate of Europe. These are things that we cannot predict, but they are possible and all of them become more likely as the change in temperature rises above even one and a half degrees Celsius. So the Wafflers' views on what to do. The Wafflers mostly want to postpone aggressive action to reduce emissions uh, and um, this should say starting now, I see a typo there. They want to postpone aggressive action to reduce emissions more rapidly starting now in favor of research and development on better technologies so emissions reductions can be made more cheaply in the future, accelerating economic progress, well, that went all together, accelerating economic progress in the developing countries is the best way to reduce their vulnerability to climate change and counting on adaptation as needed going forward to limit the damage from whatever changes in climate materialize. These sound like pretty reasonable arguments. Uh, of course, the first sign of lack of reasonableness is that the deniers and the wafflers in the top positions in the Trump administration are, with surpassing cynicism, busy cutting support for all of these approaches. All of these things they say we should do instead of taking aggressive action to reduce emissions, they're not willing to pay for. And even if implemented, the wafflers' favored approaches would in fact be grossly inadequate. Clean energy R&D is of course essential to provide options for the next stage of deep emissions reductions, but we need to be reducing now with the technologies we already have. Economic development and climate change mitigation and adaptation are not either or, but have to be pursued together. Energy for development and new infrastructure need to be climate friendly and resilient if we are to meet this challenge. And adaptation, very important, but it gets more difficult, more expensive, and less effective the larger are the changes in climate to which society must adapt. This is a very busy figure. Uh, I will post these slides on my websites at the Woods Hole Research Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, maybe they'll get posted uh, by the uh, conference so you can look at it in detail. But this, what, what this shows you is how steeply emissions need to decline if we are to hold the global average surface temperature increase even to 2 degrees C. Uh, and 1.5 degrees C, you look uh, at the bottom of this graph, the blue curves that basically go to zero before the end of this century. Our emissions have to go negative if we are to have a significant chance of holding the temperature to 1.5 degrees C. We have to start now. Finally, rejecting surrender. Many people have observed, including I should say President Obama, that climate change is not just a great challenge, it's a great opportunity. We have basically three options. The options are mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're already doing some of each. What's up to us is the future mix. Minimizing the amount of suffering in that mix can only be achieved by doing both a lot of mitigation and a lot of adaptation, and I stress again, doing it starting now. Mitigation alone won't work because climate change is already occurring and it can't be stopped quickly. Adaptation alone work, won't work, as I've already said, because adaptation gets more costly and less effective as climate change grows. What we need is enough mitigation to avoid unmanageable climate change and enough adaptation to manage the unavoidable climate change. Low future emissions do produce far less climate change than high future emissions. Most of the uncertainty, and this is very important, most of the uncertainty about the future extent of climate change resides in society's choices, not in the science. People who tell you that we're so uncertain 
about the science projecting climate impacts forward, that we shouldn't do anything until we know more, never mind that they're not willing to pay for the research. But people who tell you that are putting their thumb on the scale in favor of inaction, which is going to drastically increase the consequences. The uncertainty is not mainly coming from the science, it's mainly coming from the large range of possibilities in terms of what people decide to do. Can we afford mitigation? This is a very detailed study done by the McKinsey Corporation a few years ago of the measures that would be adequate together to keep us on a curve that would take us worldwide to uh, two degrees C or less in terms of uh, how much mitigation potential in billions of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent we would need by 2030 to get there is a supply curve, as economists will recognize, where the height of the bars represents the cost, negative bars, bars below the line, are measures that would actually make money. For example, energy conservation measures that save you so much money in energy that they more than pay for, the, for themselves. Bars above the line are things where you have to pay for the carbon reductions. What you see looking at this, and just about everything you can think of is here, solar photovoltaics, wind, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, and so on. If you look at everything there, achieving all of the reductions on that curve would require a carbon price of $70 per ton of CO2 by 2030 in 2015 dollars. That would add up to $2 trillion a year in 2030, a total tax bill worldwide. But that's not the cost, because as you see from the curve, the average cost of reduction would be much less than $70 a ton, and society could spend the difference in any other way that it chose. Gross world product in 2030 at 2.5% per year growth between now and then would be $170 trillion. So even the $2 trillion figure would be uh, only about 1% of gross world product. Today, the world spends 2.5% of gross world product on defense. The United States spends 5% on defense, 2% on environmental protection. And these costs are not a dead loss. They're just a choice about how society allocates its resources. Most economic models find that aggressive mitigation would reduce gross world product, reduce it now, by 2 to 3 percent in 2100, but all of these models are known to underestimate innovation. We can get it done cheaper than that. Furthermore, many adaptation measures would make economic sense even if climate were not changing. There have always been heat waves, floods, droughts, wildfires, powerful storms, crop pests, outbreaks of vector-borne disease, and society has always suffered from being underprepared. It's particularly perverse, then, that the Trump administration has been reversing even the win-win adaptation preparedness resilience measures adopted under Obama, the things we're doing in adaptation that would make sense even if we didn't know that climate change was increasing the intensity and frequency of these damaging events. Virtually all reputable studies suggest that the economic damages from not adequately addressing climate change would far exceed the costs of adequately addressing it. That's why it's a bargain. We're going to do much better economically if we address climate change than if we don't. And that fact and the economic opportunities in clean and resilient technologies are why cities and businesses support aggressive climate action. The Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy has over 7,400 cities, representing 685 million people, 9% of the global population committing to make reductions in their greenhouse gas emissions. Business backs low carbon. We've had uh, 1,000 companies and investors signing the Business Backs Low Carbon Agreement, writing a letter to President Obama, the Congress, and global leaders saying addressing climate change is good for business. The idea that society cannot afford to address climate change is simply wildly wrong. Trend is not destiny. Thank you. Thank you.